Welcome campers to part three of our spring series featuring Northern Arizona and Southern Utah. We are gonna see some absolutely stunning scenery and we're glad you're here to join us. Our base camp for this episode is Soap Creek Dispersed. Then we head up to White Pocket. From there, we check out Jacobs Lake and then Lone Rock Beach in Utah. For the grand finale, we take a photo tour of Antelope Canyon X, a fantastic slot canyon that we have long wanted to visit. Let's get started. Let's kickstart this visual journey with a taste of sheer wonder. Soar with us above the breathtaking Vermilion Cliffs as we reveal the stunning beauty etched into the canvas of this remarkable canyon. The recent storm had left behind a majestic spectacle. The clouds scattered across the sky, a dazzling testament to nature's drama. The undulating hills, rising in harmony with the towering cliffs, create a panorama that is nothing short of awe-inspiring. The river had not yet achieved full velocity from the winter storms, which had deposited record amounts of snow, much of which was yet to melt. Indeed, this is a realm of stark solitude, a dance of beauty and isolation. It's quite a drive in, probably six or seven miles on a pretty rough road, but it was definitely worth it. The next day, we set our sights on White Pocket, a destination long etched into our cinematic bucket list, eager to capture its untamed beauty. We passed by the Cliff Dwellers Lodge, which we explored in our prior episode. Venturing further west on Route 89A, about 18 and a half miles deep, lies the gateway to White Pocket, the unassuming House Rock Road. All this grandeur is an integral part of the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument, a splendid reserve managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Here you will also find a condor viewing site where you can watch condors flying up amongst the Vermilion Cliffs. Heed this warning. Beyond the condor viewing site, the path takes a rugged turn, evolving into a more bumpy and challenging terrain. Relying on Google navigation to guide us to White Pocket might have been a questionable choice. Despite holding a physical map in our hands, the allure of digital direction was hard to resist, a lesson we seem destined to relearn. We meandered a few miles into the hills when fate introduced us to Cody and Jeannie from Colorado. Like us, their destination was White Pocket, so we retraced our steps and set off, now following their lead. Cody and Jeannie, if you're watching, thank you for the help. Bearing the wild's grime, we couldn't help but wonder when we'd next encounter the civilization of a car wash. White Pocket lies just shy of the wilderness area, a fortunate circumstance allowing us the freedom to launch our drone and capture the mesmerizing vistas from above. A brief trek up a sandy embankment unveils White Pocket, a mere quarter mile or less from the parking area. At an altitude of approximately 6,000 feet, the chill of the highlands prompted us to don our jackets. Coupled with the persistent breeze, it was a refreshing brush with the elements. White Pocket is characterized by its unique and otherworldly rock formations, which are primarily made up of Navajo sandstone. 
The sandstone was deposited over millions of years by wind and water, and it has been sculpted by the elements into a variety of shapes, including domes, ridges, canyons, and caves. The colors of the sandstone range from white to pink to orange, and the formations are often covered in swirls and patterns that are created by the erosion of the rock. Pocket stands as a captivating alternative to the renowned Wave, an iconic destination that demands a lottery for access. While the Wave may bask in fame, White Pocket offers its own enchantment, welcoming visitors without the constraints of chance, allowing for an intimate connection with its spellbinding beauty. There were lots of puddles left over from the storms. I'm sure glad we arrived when we did and not a week earlier. Now, let us elevate our perspective to new heights, for the true splendor of White Pocket unveils itself when beheld from above. The contrast between White Pocket and the surrounding terrain is like night and day. The former, a geological anomaly landscape of strange and dramatic features that stand out in stark contrast to the rolling hills and sparse vegetation of the surrounding area. Have you ever seen a landscape that looks like it's been carved out of a giant cauliflower? These cauliflower knolls are formed by a process called differential erosion. Differential erosion is a process that occurs when different parts of a rock are eroded at different rates. In the case of cauliflower knolls, the softer parts of the rock are eroded away, leaving the harder parts behind. This creates a distinctive cauliflower-like appearance. The exact mechanism of differential erosion is not fully understood, but it is thought to have been caused by a combination of factors, including the type of rock, the direction of the wind, and the amount of water that's present. We can honestly say we have never seen a place like this before. If you have, please let us know where it is in the comments section. White Pocket is a popular destination, and it's likely that during certain times of the year it experiences significant crowds. However, on the Sunday we visited, it was relatively calm, possibly due to the challenging 20-plus mile off-road journey required to reach this hidden gym. Drone flying requires a lot of concentration. My job is far simpler. I watch the drone to ensure safe flight. By early afternoon, as we made the decision to depart, the majority of visitors had already bid farewell to White Pocket, leaving behind a tranquil ambience to embrace. If you don't feel adventurous or don't have a vehicle that can make it on its own, you can hire a tour to take you to White Pocket. There are several tour guides available that will bring you here, and even Jeep rentals. Check Google. Not sure why I'm avoiding the water. This truck's already filthy.
Well, that was an incredible sight, and it lived up to our expectations. We hope you too have a chance to come out here sometime and enjoy it as well. Filled with a sense of adventure, we set our compass to the west, heading up 89A, eager to explore the possibility of reaching the majestic north rim of the Grand Canyon. The view of the Vermilion Cliffs from up on the Kaibab Plateau is majestic. Was a decent covering of snow as we gained elevation. We had discussed moving camp up here off of one of the forest roads, but once we saw the conditions, we realized the folly in that plan. the road was only open to the Jacobs Lake General Store. We stopped and checked things out, but the restaurant was closed and there was no place to sit and have a beer or a glass of wine. They did sell some very nice cookies though. If you're passing by, you might try them out. On our way back to camp, we took the chance to further explore the captivating geography from above. It allowed us to gain a fresh perspective and uncover more of the hidden wonders scattered across the land. We look up at the snow-covered Kebab Plateau in stark contrast to the desert foreground. The Great Western Trail passes through this way, although we didn't explore it this time. location, the Vermilion Cliffs soar majestically, ascending approximately 1,500 feet above 89A. The Vermilion Cliffs were formed over millions of years by the deposition of silt and sand, followed by the cementation of these sediments into a sandstone. The red color of the cliffs is due to the presence of iron oxide minerals in the sandstone. The Colorado River then cut through that sandstone to make the cliffs. The surroundings are adorned with intriguing canyons, beckoning the adventurous spirit within. While time constraints prevented us from exploring them on this particular journey, the prospect of venturing into these captivating chasms lingers in our thoughts. Next evening, we decided to head up to the Page area. The drive up is so pretty, and you literally cut right through a large red rock mountain. Just north of Page, you see this overlook of the Glen Canyon Dam. We decided to head up towards Lone Rock to see what the camping situation looked like. The lake was still quite low, although snow was beginning to melt, and soon this would have an impact on the lake level. In fact, there was no water at the edge of Lone Rock at all. There's a bunch of dispersed camping here around the rock and it's $14 a night. Plus, you need your admission fee or have a national park pass. We decided we're going to add this to our list of places to visit someday. We also visited Horseshoe Bend. We've been here before, but it's been many years and there wasn't nearly as much built up at that time. I don't even think there was a parking area or a trail. You can't fly a drone here. Oh well, that would have been really fun. If you really want to get in trouble, try flying a drone while rollerblading off trail. There were quite a few people out here and this was not even the weekend. but we still managed to get a great view spot despite the crowds. We saw some people camping down on the beach. I think the only way to get there is by boat or raft. A few 
you haven't seen Horseshoe Bend, you definitely want to make time for this stop. Some people climb quite far out onto the ledge. We were a bit more restrained. So while we did have to fight some crowds, in the end, the photos were well worth it. Fortunately, when driving through Page, we noticed a car wash, and the truck was in desperate need. The price was decent, and the equipment worked fine. By this time, it was pretty chilly out, and it was an ideal car washing temperature, but we really needed to get that mud off the vehicle, and I didn't know when our next opportunity would present. Dang spotted this giant chicken from afar. Her razor-honed skills at locating fried chicken had kicked into gear. And it didn't disappoint. They have a number of different recipes of fried chicken, from mild to spicy. Of course, we ordered too much, but it's always good the next day. Be watchful of the low ceiling over the parking area, though. The next morning, Dang headed off to explore Antelope Canyon X. She had a photography tour booked there, which gives you more time and fewer people. Antelope Canyon X is a nice alternative to the upper and lower Antelope Canyons. Those get super busy with people, and they don't offer photography tours anymore. This is on Navajo Nation land, so you adhere to their rules. They only had five people on this photography tour, so it's not very crowded, and you can take your time getting the shots you want. We're going to do a slideshow of this part, as videos are frowned upon here. The Antelope Canyons are basically slot canyons cut into Navajo sandstone. They were created as a result of flash floods that rushed through the valley and into the canyons, carving out and eroding the canyon. This happens especially around here due to monsoon rains, which can occur over short periods of time and dump a lot of water, leading to floods and flash floods. This shot highlights the signature X for which the canyon is named. If you do sign up for the photography tour, you also get the added benefit of having the knowledgeable guide with you. Dang's guide Van was a super nice guy and helped point out some really great shots. If you haven't been to one of the Antelope Canyons, this is highly recommended. It's just fascinating. These stairs are how you enter and exit the canyon. After Antelope Canyon X, we decided to break camp and head to Kanab, Utah, our next stop. It was a windy day and forecast to get worse, and we had to make our way up through the mountains. We will be staying at the RV Corral, and oh boy, are we looking forward to full hookups. We hope you have enjoyed this video. We spent a good amount of time producing it. If you liked it, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel. Thanks for watching.